Hello, everyone. Good afternoon. I'm Rachel Patton, Executive Director of Preserve Arkansas. Preserve Arkansas is the statewide nonprofit advocate for historic preservation. Welcome to Women in Preservation, the series that features Arkansas women who are working to save the state's historic places. I want to thank our series sponsor, DMX Architecture of Fayetteville, for their generous support of Women in Preservation. If you haven't already checked out the full 2023 lineup of speakers for Women in Preservation, please do so. They are on our website at preservearkansas.org. Many of you are already members of Preserve Arkansas, and we thank you for your generous support. If you are not already a member, I'd like to invite you to formally join us for as little as $50 a year. Your membership is vital to the support of our organization and to allow us to do our work of saving Arkansas's historic places. We just put out our call for nominations for the 2023 list of Arkansas's most endangered historic places, and we need your help. Anyone may nominate a place to our most endangered list, and you can learn more and nominate on our website at preservearkansas.org before March 31st. Please join us next month for a talk by Dr. Paige Ford, station archeologist at the Arkansas Archeological Survey's research station at Plum Bayou Mounds Archeological State Park. And now it's my pleasure to introduce today's speaker, my friend, Holly Hope. Holly Hope has been with the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program in the Department of Parks, Heritage and Tourism for 27 years. She received her Bachelor of Arts degree in history from the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. Holly held the position of National Register Historian at AHPP before becoming Special Projects Historian in Community Outreach. Holly writes articles and lectures on various aspects of Arkansas history, such as the mixed masonry homes of Silas Owens Sr., Arkansas in the New Deal, and home front efforts in Arkansas during World War II. Holly writes and edits nominations for the National and Arkansas Register of Historic Places. Holly created the Hands-On Cemetery Preservation Program for the public to learn the basics of repairing and cleaning gravestones. She also lectures on maintenance and, excuse me, maintenance and safety in cemeteries and how to interpret historic symbolism on gravestones. Welcome, Holly. Hi, Rachel. Hi, there you are. Hello, okay. everyone. Thank you, Rachel. You're and welcome. I really appreciate you asking me to be a part of this series. I really hope I can be informative without putting everyone to sleep. Rachel and I have known each other for a while, having worked together at the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program, now known as Arkansas Department of Parks, Heritage, and Tourism. And, and I'm really in awe of her work and her intellect. Um, I have trouble accepting that I fit in with the previous speakers in this series because I am nowhere near the caliber of those ladies, much less Rachel. But um, I guess that to, to make myself feel better, I must consider that my experiences and my interests could be termed vernacular. I never obtained a degree above a bachelor in a bachelor's degree in liberal arts. And I have sometimes molded my own projects and research areas, which I guess you could say would be a vernacular way of approaching my work. So that's me, vernacular. I also have a soft spot for vernacular architecture and art produced to be functional and expressive, drawing on social, economic, and cultural circumstances. And my approach to history is to look at those circumstances investigate the origins and influences, and then follow the thread to significance. So Rachel has asked where my interest in history came from. And I guess I would have to say that it was my mother. 
My biggest influence before going to college was Barbara Thompson. And I totally credit her with firmly instilling my love of history and architecture. On weekends, she would stuff me and my sister into the Rambler and we would go on drives in the country or to state parks. And it was all Arkansas locations. The only time we got out of the state was when we went to Silver Dollar City in Missouri. On our drives, my mother would keep an eye out for abandoned buildings and we would just simply take ourselves inside. And the one that stands out to me is when we strayed into the Butterfield House, also known as the John Gould Fletcher House at Pinnacle State Park. And of course, back then in ancient history, Pinnacle Mountain State Park didn't exist. So the state didn't own the house and there were not a lot of other houses around. And my mom figured it was okay. The door was unlocked. But after we got inside, we were soon confronted by the owner. Um, all was good, and he didn't call the sheriff, as a couple of kids and a sweet lady seemed to cause no problem. But back in the recesses of my mind, I can, I can still remember it. And I remember this, the titillation of walking through this house. I can remember a portrait of a woman on the landing of the stairs. And I, I don't know if I'm inserting this into my memory, but it, I feel as though it were a historic portrait as in the 19th century. I don't know what has happened to that portrait, if I invented it or what, but I can like see her face. So seeing the spaces in this building and how they differed from my little house, the materials that they used, the, the way it smelled was exciting to me and getting caught added to the excitement. I was hooked. About that same time, I began reading library books about colonial architecture and furnishings. My garage became a single pin cabin where I played poor settler woman on the prairie, usually alone, as you can imagine. When the little boy next door came to play, I made him wear a dress and be a fellow settler woman. This is how serious I was. I grew up in Kamek Village, which was a World War II housing development providing overflow housing for men who were stationed at Camp Robinson. The community featured seven architectural styles, and our house was a type A Greek influence plan with single bay porch variant. While I was attending a birthday party at a neighbor's house at age eight, I informed the mother that her house was the same floor plan as mine. The look she gave me was a mixture of pity and fear. There was no comment on her part. She just simply walked away. But with those words, I believe my future as a historian was decided. Sadly, today, Kamek Village is being decimated by teardowns, and um, this is where I, I fuss a little all the time and reiterate that just because a house is not high style or it doesn't have a three-car garage, it doesn't mean that it doesn't have a place in history and it's not a functional place for families. And Kamek was very historic, being a community that arose from World War II efforts in Arkansas, and it's linked to the event of World War II. So watching these Kamek cottages just steadily disappear has, has kind of torn a hole in my personal sense of place. This is my dad, Wayne Thompson. Uh, my father's side of the family was from Centerville in Faulkner County. He didn't talk about it, so I had no information about exactly where he was from or what his life was like. Um, in the early 2000s, I happened to be in Centerville document, documenting the Methodist Church, and I met two men from the area. I told them my dad was from there and asked if they knew him, and one of them said, I knew your dad. He went to school right here, and he lived right across the road. I then told him, I, he then told me that I, he was, I was related to a person named Conway, I called that person and he informed me that there was a family reunion in a week. The mystery of where I came from was revealed. It was a rural farmhouse in cotton country. My dad picked cotton before he joined the Air Force. Years later, I was on a survey trip to document a collection of vernacular structures. The owner told me with stars in her eyes that they were authentic hillbilly cabins. And now I'm sure what she had in mind were barefooted hicks drinking from a jug on the porch, but you could also use that term for me without the jug. 
This is a photo of my fraternal hillbilly family in Centerville. And I don't use the term hillbilly as an insult because what I see in this photo are hardworking people that supported each other and were part of a community. Their vernacular home wasn't architect designed. They weren't dressed in expensive clothes. Some of them worked at CCC camps in the area, but I wish I had known about them earlier because they tied me to early Faulkner County. Just like Kamek Village, I now had another spot to call home. So my thought to the hillbilly comment at the time was, lady, I come from a long line of hillbillies and I'm cool with that. On my mother, excuse me, you know what? I have to go back to another PowerPoint. Hold on just a second. Rachel, can you assist me for a second? Yes. I'm in the wrong PowerPoint presentation. Um. If you can just, do you know where the other one is? Should be on here, but it's not. Okay, well, I'm just gonna make do with this. Okay. And I'm gonna go back to my hillbilly family. Okay. All right, can everybody see it now? Um, not yet. We need to restart the slideshow or resume from there. Can you hit that little, remember that little button down? There you go. Okay. So I'm going to go back to my family. Um, on my mother's side of the family, there was my beautiful, graceful grandmother, Bertha, and my grandfather, Charles who was a dentist. My mother's childhood home in Seward was a prairie style house. Their lives were a little different from Centerville, but my maternal grandfather came to Nebraska on an orphan train. Here again, my roots are showing in the background of Grampy. So while I certainly appreciate the high style grace and form of formal architecture, I also recognize how these styles grew from humble beginnings. So there's a yin and a yang in my family tree. It's in my blood. I have humble beginnings too, and I'm moved by both forms, but I have a special affinity for the vernacular. While simultaneously working as a cocktail waitress, I attended the University of Arkansas at Little Rock. There was no question that I wanted to major in history. At one point, I was accused of plagiarizing a paper about historic architecture because the professor said it read like a slick magazine article. And I had mixed feelings about this. I, I did not plagiarize it, but I guess I just didn't look sophisticated enough to write something like that, which believe me was not that complicated a paper. On the other hand, it was a backhanded compliment. Obviously, he did not know of my youthful preparation for historic preservation through reading books about colonial Williamsburg. Perhaps it was my hillbilly background. I really enjoyed all my classes related to my major. My minor was anthropology, which prepared me for historic research, and it made it easier for me to determine how to make my point, where to pull the threads from, in order to illustrate the history of a building or a district. After graduation, I put my skills to use answering the phones at the Arkansas Historic Preservation Program, but I was strategically placed to worm my way into preservation. With my eye on the prize, I voluntarily wrote and presented National Register nominations to get experience. The most frightening part was standing up in front of the State Review Board for the first time to deliver my presentation. But once I got started, I felt like I was in the right place. In 1997, the good people at HPP eventually saw that my efforts were sincere and I was hired as a National Register historian. As an official member of the National Register team, I traveled around the state documenting sites, buildings, objects, structures, and districts for listing on the National Register of Historic Places. 
If a resource was considered potentially eligible by the Historic Preservation Determination of Eligibility team, then the nomination would be written for presentation to the State Review Board. If the board members did not reject it, have revisions or questions, it would reach another level of potentiality. From there, it went to the National Park Service for the reader to look over and they would decide if it was officially listed. And that's how it still works today. I still submit nominations and I edit cemetery nominations. So to someone with my background, a backseat writer who traveled across the state to view dirt roads, forested areas and old houses, this was a dream job. This was what I had been trained for all my life by my mother. Eventually, I moved to the community outreach program area, which is where I am now. And obviously, this included getting out in the state, giving lectures, and assisting in tours of historic properties and districts. The topics for lectures often came from multiple property contexts. And these were papers that were based on the history of resources that were constructed because of a certain event. These resources might be found in specific regions or across the state, but on their own, they might not have enough history to make a case for an individual National Register listing. So the context provided the history and they could be nominated as a component of that context. Some of the contexts I wrote, as Rachel mentioned, were um, cattle dipping vats, World War II home front structures, and the alphabet agencies of the New Deal. But my favorite context and one that meant the most to me were the mixed masonry structures of Silas Owens Sr. These were houses, schools, churches, and commercial buildings that were constructed by the talented African-American stonemason from Faulkner County. And this is Silas Owens Sr. And, and I love this photo because he didn't actually wear glasses. It was a photographer's prop. And he thought that they made him look smart. His trademark style was a mixture, mixture of sandstone and cream brick trim, but what made his method unique was that he used a 45 degree angle when he laid up the stone. Sometimes he used geometric coursing or both techniques on the same building. So take a close look at the coursing in this photo. Um, this was his first mixed masonry, the Charlie Hall House in Twin Groves. And you can see how the stones are shaped and the coursing is filled in with little tiny stones. This was because he wanted the coursing to look like brick mortar, tight and straight. No one utilized the style of coursing, so his buildings were easily recognized and he was, he was greatly respected for his work ethic and skills. He was not formally trained, rather he learned in the field and from working with the WPA. He contributed to the Elephant House at the Little Rock Zoo under the New Deal program. Um, Silas was very adamant that his crew, which included his sons and his daughters, not fall back on sloppiness and that they provide the client with a crisp masonry structure. But at the same time, his buildings reflected his clients' personalities. Okay, well, we're going to have to go back to... <laughs> the other presentation. That's okay. If you've got it on that computer, you can just minimize this and go find it. Okay, let me do that. Okay. I'm sorry, everybody. That's okay. Got it. You're all good, Holly. <laughs> it's fine. Okay. See, I told you this was going to happen. <laughs> you got all these good comments. Everybody loves it. You're, you're good. Okay. I'm going to find it for y'all, I promise. 
they're going to wait for you. It's going to be fine. <laughs> Somebody's sending me a message, but I can't see it. <laughs> oh, no, no, don't worry. They're just, they're just sending you. No, I mean, there's somebody. <laughs> oh, somebody else. <laughs> what, Molly? I sent it to you. Oh, okay. Come here. Huh? I don't see teams on here. So. Here, Holly, um, if you stop your video and mute yourself, then you can, if if somebody needs to come back there and help you, they can, and they won't be on. Um, just a second. Okay. I don't know where it went. It was, I guess I can see it. Mm -hmm. I can see it working in your special projects history. Mm -hmm. <laughs> this is Molly. Molly's going to help me because I'm totally. Not signed in. No. I'm not signed in. Okay. Oh, do you have your email on it? I can just get there or go to the network. Um, here. Okay, here. I had this open, I swear to God. Here. Huh? The, the, the network drive right there. Don't go back to file. Like, drive there. And then go to special project. I'm sorry, but I don't really want to It's not. It was in, unless the network access. Yeah, I think the network access okay, is funky in here. Just, I can just email it to you. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, anyway, guys, what I'm talking about is Silas Owens. Um, I'm going to go on to talking about uh, the things that he liked to do. He liked to allow children to put marbles in the coursing of his buildings. And I have a great picture of a marble here. And someone is sending me the link.
Rachel, have I lost you? No, no, I'm here. Okay. It's still not the right one. So what are some of the comments <laughs> so far? Um, okay, I'm sorry. I didn't know if you were still focusing on that. I wasn't going to interrupt you. No, so far they're, I mean, they're all, they're all saying no worries. It's fascinating to take your time and try <laughs> to, to try to try to find My presentation it. has disappeared. <laughs> okay. So anyway, guys. I well, you've got, you've got all your good things to say. So you can, I can just turn my camera off and you can just talk if you want. I probably will have to do that because um, the girl that was going to email me the presentation, my email's not hooked up in here. So anyway, with Silas Owens, he, he would allow children to put marbles in the mortar joints. So you might still see those marbles or the indentions made by them. And one woman had a collection of crystals that she wanted included in her home. Unfortunately, this house was destroyed for a driveway at a Kroger. Another home in Damascus had a turquoise embedded in it because the owner just thought it was pretty. Silas Sr.'s own home in Twin Groves had crystals and broken mirror shards in the gables. I'm going to look again because we really have some great photos. I don't understand where it went to. If they can, if you, if they, if you know that that file is somewhere, <laughs> then if you need to get up and go get it and put it on a jump drive or something and bring it back in. No, that won't work in here. Okay. Well then if you can't find it, then maybe you can share it with me and I can post them. I can post it as like a PDF they can look at later. Okay, I'm so sorry. I really, okay. really hate this. Anyway, I met um, his son, Silas Owens Jr. And I talked him into driving around Faulkner County and surrounding areas with me to identify his father's work. And he was really delighted to do that because he admired his father and he strove to emulate his principles. His niece, Lily Owens, told me how he would build her these little rock doll houses and tell her to straighten the seam on her stockings. Silas Jr. told me a story of a home in Quitman that was built by his dad, Sr. And after his death, the owner wanted an addition in the same style. So she hired Jr. The lady was a quilter and she told him that her father's work had reminded her of quilts. So she wanted to lay a stone up on the addition. And I could see from these words, this story that Junior told me that he recognized that his father's work was artistry. The rocks he used were hand shaped and he would pick out these light and dark stones so that the palette was pleasing. He also used a crimped piece of metal to create a shadow line around each rock so that they popped and they had these very distinct dimensions. Any mortar that dripped was immediately wrapped up, wiped up with a towel. The family stories conveyed why his buildings were, were so articulate and so sharp, because it was in his veins. Many of Senior's buildings exhibited craftsmen, English revival, and Mediterranean influences as well. And I know of only one house that was built using a blueprint from Kansas City. And the others were designed by Senior. So Silas Owens Jr. passed away a few years ago. Um, 
And so we don't have his experiences in his in his stories anymore. But but I was so thrilled to have to meet him and to meet his family and to get his unique perspective on his father's work. No one I interviewed had a single complaint about his work. And in fact, the title of the context, A Storm Couldn't Tear Them Down, was uttered by a Mr. McGinty who lived in an Owens house. Mr. McGinty went and got his sledgehammer and whacked the house to show me how sturdy it was. Unfortunately, I didn't get a picture, so I asked him to reenact it for the camera. So you can see here that the path of my heart is um, vernacular, as these homes were considered a vernacular form. And that's why that project was so exciting and important to me. Being a special projects historian allowed me to be free to use my imagination and create projects. One day when I was working in Benton County, I noticed this really nice barn that was on a, a parcel of land that was for sale. And I became concerned about the fate of that barn because agricultural land in that area of the state is very rapidly being developed. And then I became obsessed with it. I very clumsily hatched a plan to document these barns because I felt that the property type was endangered. Historically, Arkansas was primarily agricultural. The farm was the moneymaker and the source of food for the family and the community. Benton County agriculture in the 19th and early 20th centuries was concentrated on livestock, vegetables, wheat, and fruit. A lot of the barns remaining in the county were cattle slash hay barns. Structures for fruit were different. They weren't so large, but we did document a couple of apple dryers. So in my mind, these buildings were important reminders of who we were, and in some instances, they could document immigration patterns as the style of the barn might reflect the builder's home state or their country of origin. There were no imminent plans for an article or a context, but my goal was to provide information so future researchers could determine where certain styles were concentrated, the type of agriculture practiced in the county and farm locations, and also for them to be archived as part of the story of Arkansas. To prepare for this adventure, I got copies of topographic maps of the county. Barns on topo maps are represented by clear squares. So I searched for these squares and being technologically challenged as everyone has figured out by now, my technique was to circle the squares. Then I would go to Google Earth and zoom in and see if there was a structure currently on the site. If not, I would put a very high-tech X on it with a red pin. When we documented a barn, I would use a yellow Sharpie to designate the barn and assign it a number. And now I, at this point, I know there are people out there that are shaking their heads at this, but it took me a lot less time to do that than to learn how to have a computer do it for me. And it didn't bring me to tears. So armed with these maps, I would pick a quadrangle within the county and just hit the road. Through the winter months, I would drag a coworker with me to drive while I told them where to turn. We would roll up on a house, or if it was a lone barn on a dirt road, we would just hop out and take photos. Of course, the preference is to get permission so we wouldn't be loaded full of buckshot. The coworker would stay in the running car, making sure that the state emblem on the car was visible while I asked permission. I was worried at first that there would be a great deal of resistance to allowing us access, but um, I was very pleasantly surprised because there were very few people that denied us permission. The other thing that surprised me was that most of the barns were built in the 1940s. I don't remember any that were 19th century and the earliest dated to the 1920s. A handful of barns were houses that were converted, so there would be interior walls and double hung windows remaining. They would just add sheds to the side and then the animals would take over. One interesting thing I found were a series of barns in Benton County that had a little star shaped cutout at the gable where the hay hood is. Sometimes barns will have a diamond cut to allow owls to go in and out. At least that's what I was told, but these star-shaped ones were said to have been on barns constructed by a man named George White. So here was a local craftsman that added to the story of Benton County agricultural structures. 
I also found out that there were these little doors at the foundation of the barns, kind of in weird places. And these were called muck holes to scoop out animal waste. So now you know that they weren't doors for just short animals, which was what I thought. After I finished Benton County, I went on to document Washington County. The most unique barn that I documented was the National Register listed Mac Morton barn, which is an 11 sided horse barn in Appleby with a conical roof. The horse stalls are pie shaped and then the feed goes into a central cylinder up in the loft and then it comes down and then the horses with their little heads would be in the point of the pie shape. The roof was really amazing. It was almost cathedral like. I admired the builder's bravery. The path to finding this barn began with a discovery in a historic newspaper. I had found this 1930s blurb in Ripley's Believe It or Not about a man from Arkansas, Northwest Arkansas specifically, who had gone to Africa. He admired the conical homes that he saw there. So when he got back to Arkansas, he built a round log barn with a conical roof. You know, talk about vernacular. This was based on a true vernacular building. So I really wanted to know more and to see if anything was left of this structure. There was not, but I asked around and at that point I had discovered the Matt Morton barn. There had been another round barn next door, but it had burnt. And as far as I know, this is the only such barn in Arkansas. So the people and the animals that went along with the barns were wonderful. They were, they were really awesome and interesting. Um, some experiences included getting permission to document from a fellow who did not look thrilled that I was knocking on the door. He just seemed to have this permanent scowl on his face. So he stared at me for a minute, or rather glared at me for a minute. And to my astonishment, he said, sure, go ahead. So as I was taking photos, my coworker in the car said he came out with an ax. And she came up in her head with a plan of action in case he came after me. She was going to honk the horn and I was to run through the woods and scale a barbed wire fence to the getaway car. The trouble was I really wouldn't know why he was honking, why she was honking. There were people who answered the door in their underwear and one fellow who answered in a bathrobe. And we both knew that that robe was coming open, and it did. Luckily, he had on Speedos. As I was documenting a barn on Miser Road in Benton County, a cat started to follow me down the road. The cat walked a little ways with me, and then it peeled off. On my way back from the barn, it returned, and it spat out this little bundle of fur at my feet. It then turned on its heel and walked away. I thought it was a dead rat, but it proved to be a tiny kitten that it evidently didn't want anymore. So little miser Meep at the kitten came back to Little Rock and got a home with a coworker, and her name is now Skitty. A barn visit in Cane Hill ended with me finding a baby squirrel on the ground. We named it Bobby Sue Girl Squirrel, and we tucked her in my coat, but, decided, but she decided that she liked my head better. And as I was talking to the director of Historic Cane Hill, it started cavorting through my hair. Professionalism. And Bobby Sue, we, uh, we took her to Berryville to a rehabber. And as far as I know, she lived out her life with the rehabber in Berryville and perhaps may still be around. So there are a lot of stories of the wonderful people I met being chased by bucking horses while my coworker was looking at her phone, not paying attention to my yells for help being spat on by a llama and repeatedly headbutted by a donkey. But I'll, I'll stop with those stories. So the, this ultimate vernacular form, the barn, was fascinating. It was hardy. It was informative and beautiful. And it was a really great project that I was proud and glad to be a part of. We did have a couple of barn restoration projects with a man named Rudy Christian, who has done barn restoration projects around the world. He's a really fascinating man, um, very knowledgeable. These were designed to make barn owners aware of problem spots and what would need to be repaired first in order to preserve their building. 
So my dream would be to document barns in other counties. And I hope that I can at some point because I really think this is an obsession. Another great project was documenting remnant sections of the Trail of Tears through Arkansas with my boss. The project was in conjunction with the National Trails Office of the National Park Service, another chance to put my skills of looking out car windows to use. Using historic maps, diary accounts, and just plain looking for roads in the woods, we photographed and mapped extant sections for the archives and for listing on the National and Arkansas registers. We even at one point went out on a boat to document water segments. It was not without its dangers as my boss and co-worker entered a field in Atkins to seek out a section. Once we were over the fence, we discovered a bull that was making threatening gestures in our direction. I raised my hand and said, no. The bull thought it over and it backed down. Lucky for me, because as I turned to get away, I noticed that the guys were already on the other side of the fence. This also made its way into my performance evaluation. The same guys decided that I needed to scale a fence to document a log house. So they threw me over to take photos just about the time that the owner pulled up to see what was going on. Thus, they were able to pretend that it was my idea, but the guy was okay with it. So lastly, the project that I continue working on today is my cemetery preservation workshops. In the early 2000s, I inherited cemetery projects from another lady in the office who had moved on. She had facilitated a couple of programs, including cemetery lectures. As I was looking for potential speakers, I found that Jason Church at the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training in Louisiana did workshops on cleaning gravestones. So I contacted Jason and he came in 2007 to do our first hands-on workshop at Hollywood Cemetery in Hot Springs. Jason is the definition of expert and people really loved learning from him. So I thought this was a really great format and I wanted to expand it. So I decided to add basic repair to the agenda. At first, we had workshops once a year. We had various contractors, and they were, they were really well-received. We had good groups with an interest in repairing their family stones. We had cemetery maintenance people and cemetery friends groups. So the workshops went up to two a year. Then we expanded to four times a year. We have had folks from Texas, Mississippi, Louisiana, Tennessee, Oklahoma, and one couple from Hawaii. But to be honest, they were their visiting friends. So the way we begin our workshops, we start with a discussion of issues that are specific to the cemetery. The contractor will walk around and, and point out various stones and say, this is how I would deal with this. This is what the problem is with this. We then go to cleaning where people break into groups and they clean their own stones. Then in the afternoon, we do leveling and repair. In these workshops, we want people to take part and we want them to put their hands on the grave marker so that they can see that it's relatively easy to maintain your cemetery. These are conducted under the supervision of professional contractors with years of experience and the two that we use just have a crazy amount of knowledge in their brain. So it's not just up to me telling you how to do it. These guys know exactly what mortars to use, what epoxies and cleaning materials are appropriate for gravestones. These same materials and techniques that they talk about have been tested by the National Center for Preservation Technology and Training over a series of years. They do not recommend anything unless it's been thoroughly vetted. So if anybody is interested in these free workshops, just let me know and I can put you on our mailing list. But if people just need someone to come and talk about cleaning gravestones, I can do that and just give me a call and I'll be very happy to do a demonstration. Um, we also bring kids into the uh, cemetery aspect of community outreach. I work with our K through 12 education coordinator, Amy Milliken, to bring this cemetery education to kids in classrooms. 
We have a couple of programs and we hope to expand it soon. Um, two formats that we use are discussions of cemetery symbolism and a scavenger hunt for certain symbols. We have the kids talk about, and it sounds gory, but it's really not. And it's part of our mission is to get the kids to talk about what they might like on their own gravestone. We talk about how some gravestones have a, a a broken tree branch on it to symbolize a life cut short or a rose that's broken to symbolize the same thing. So a kid might draw a picture of a guitar because they like to play guitars with broken strings on it. So that brings them into the idea that cemeteries are not places to be feared, that a cemetery has a lot more to offer than just sitting in it and telling ghost stories. We also have the kids clean gravestones. And the, the one that we did with the kids at the Cherry Hill Cemetery in Scott County was really well received. The kids, I was talking to them and they were like can, raising their hand going, can we go ahead and start cleaning now? And boy, they got out there and they had their brushes and their water and they were getting at it. Um, what we hope to accomplish with this is to give children a respect for cemeteries, to make them recognize that what they're looking at is artwork, whether it be historic or newer, and also to recognize the stories of the people who are buried there. If they're from that community, then that also makes it more real to them. If they know that these markers are more than just a rock and that those, those pictures on the stone meant something to the family and they can connect it to their own past in their community, then they might be less likely to grow up and vandalize a cemetery, and they also might want to be part of future cleanup and maintenance efforts. So as part of the outreach program, I also give lectures about cemetery maintenance and safety and iconography or symbolism found on gravestones. Working with the cemeteries also means that I'm on the radar for very interesting cemetery questions. A recent one was an issue with cows that scratch their behinds on the stones causing damage, which happens a lot, by the way. It is a felony in the state of Arkansas to disturb a cemetery, but I really wasn't quite sure how to help them since the sheriff likely would not go after the cows. Um, I offered her a few suggestions talking to the county judge to maybe get with the, the farmer and their cows and make sure that they're fenced in. So hopefully she was able to find help. Other folks are looking for relatives a lot of times, um, so I, I have to direct them to websites maybe that uh, like Ancestry.com or Find a Grave so they can look for their ancestor. But most of the time, the problems that they have are damaged from, by a farmer encroaching on a cemetery or vandalism. I have visited several cemeteries because of this aspect of my work, and I've seen some really amazing gravestones. But by now, you know me, and you know that what I'm most impressed by and moved by are the vernacular stones. Some of the examples that you might see would be um, a concrete pad that has bottle caps in it spelling out a person's name, or um, a symbol made with the bottle caps, or marbles. We see quite a few marbles. A um, couple of the ones that I've seen are uh, a man who evidently liked playing pool and had the, the pool balls. I don't know. know I don't play pool, so I don't know all this terminology, but it had the, the little thing you put the balls in and then you, you put them all together before you hit them with the stick. And then the legs on the sign with his name were made with pool cues. Um, we just recently listed a cemetery, the Macedonia Cemetery in Lone Oak County on the Arkansas Register, a small African-American cemetery. And as they were digging around um, doing cleanup, they unearthed a concrete gravestone that had these ceramic hands with pink fingernail polish on them embracing an urn. So this was an unusual form of vernacular gravestone and one that that was really unique because I don't know where they would have gotten that little emblem from. In Forest City, I've seen concrete gravestones in the shape of a cross and they have embedded in them this heavy gauge wire that spells out the name and the birth and death date of the person who's buried there. 
Also, I've seen little butterflies. I saw a recent vernacular gravestone in um, up in the northern part of the state that had crosses embedded in concrete and it had a rubber heart of some sort with a little person praying in it embedded into the rubber heart. So just sometimes these are found objects. Sometimes these are things that people make. Um, they're no less heartfelt than a large marble marker that was done by a noted carver. Usually family members put them together. So they can be very poignant tributes and an artistic creation at the same time. Um, out of all of the wonderful vernacular stones I've seen, nothing intrigued me more than one that I found in Drew County when I was doing research for an article on Drew County iconography. Uh, I traveled around the county to all different points and then went into the middle and I just looked through the cemeteries to see what kind of unique iconography there might be. And I started noticing these concrete gravestones that they were either slant markers or they were flat markers, upright markers, but they were all done by the same person evidently because they would have these, these flowers on either side that had four petals on them and then a long stem with leaves. And sometimes they would have this filigreed border around them. A couple of times I saw one with stars on it that might designate a fraternal uh, organization of some sort. But I was really, really intrigued by this um, because they were everywhere. They were in black cemeteries, they were in white cemeteries, and some of them would have death dates on them from 1890, I mean 1890s or the early 20th century, and then on up into the 80s, 40s, 50s. And so I thought, you know, that this must, this one carver must have been asked to create a grave marker for maybe someone who just had a field stone that was unmarked or uh, they just needed to replace a gravestone that was falling apart. And I really, really wanted to know who this person was. I referred to the creator as Four Point Flower Man. Um, it looked like he maybe had, like I was talking about the heavy gauge wire before, a little heavy gauge wire mold that had these flowers. It was the same flower every time. I really wanted to know more, so I asked around but no one seemed to really know anything until I met a woman at a workshop in Monticello who had a little bit of information. She connected me with a cousin of the man who was responsible for doing this, and his name was Hubert Gumpert, which was the best name ever for this gravestone. I wanted to write an article about Hubert and his technique, but I have not been successful because the only thing that I found out was that he rode around town on his Harley in his underwear. This man needs to be recognized for something other than that. So if anybody has any intelligence on Hubert Gumpert or maybe some family members in Drew County, please, please let me know. Um, when he passed away, he had his own gravestone pre-made, I'm sure, because it had the little flowers on it. It had the filigree, but you could see where he had stamped in the birth date, but the the death date underneath it was not as meticulous. It was not as crisp. It's like someone didn't quite know how to press the mold into the concrete to make it work. But he was buried under his own symbol. I also love how people decorate cemetery plots. I just recently saw a grave that had a mailbox that said, forward to heaven and there were notes and messages inside the mailbox. And evidently this is not uncommon, that was just the first one I had seen. So just like when families hired a carver to create images that were symbols of the interred's character on a gravestone, today people include actual photos etched in granite, or they leave grave goods that may symbolize their family member something that they they enjoyed, something that they thought was pretty. Uh, as in children, you would find the teddy bear, or you would find various kinds of toys. One of the things that I saw was a wooden Indian and around it were pinwheels and there were flowers around the side of it. And that's one of the best, but I've also seen grave plots just 
filled with these huge giant metal flowers that you can buy from roadside vendors along the highway. And just every inch of the plot is taken up with colored glass and toys and these flowers and anything else that this person found interesting. So to me, they're just very fun and they're just very exuberant. So that is all I have to say about cemeteries. Um, but I will say it's always been ironic to me that as a child, I remember riding in the car with my dad and we passed a cemetery. I told my dad that cemeteries scared me and he said, then don't look at them. I didn't look for a very long time, but, but now I'm just square in the middle of them. And I, I like it, I enjoy it. And I look at them all the time now. So that is my path to historic preservation. And like I said, it was not a formal path. Um, I've been lucky to have people at Arkansas Historic Preservation Program that supported me and my ideas. And I'm really glad to have worked here for a little over the last quarter of a century, which sounds like a really terrible thing for someone my age to say. But that is all I have to say, Rachel. Thank you, Holly. You're welcome. You did great. You did great. <laughs> okay. Now we got some comments and questions. Let's see. Let's do the questions first. Well, we, we talked earlier. I think um, if it's okay, Holly, will you share your, when you find it, the PowerPoint as a PDF? Yeah. Yeah. And then I can share it with the folks who registered. Well, I worked so hard on that PowerPoint. And <laughs> I, I had some really great photos, but I, this laptop that I'm working on, um, when I opened it up, it said not all your drives are connected. So that may be what the issue is. But don't ask me because I don't know anything about computers. <laughs> it's okay. Typical I apologize to everyone. <laughs> it's okay. Yeah. Okay. We, will, we will share it later. Um, okay. Next question. Was Silas Owens also an architect or did he work with someone else? He worked completely for himself. He did the carpentry work. He did the cabinetry. He just had a team that worked under him and he was in charge of everything. He was you. referred to as an architect, though. I did find an article in a newspaper, I think that was from the 1950s, about him working with a team on a Methodist church in Damascus, which was interesting because it was a white team working with his African-American team. And it's really a cool church, but they referred to him as an architect, but he was not, he did not go to school. He didn't go past, I believe, the eighth grade in school. So, Wow. And is most of is most of his work concentrated in that area of Faulkner, Van Buren counties? Yes, because he lived in Twin Groves, which is mm -hmm. right outside of Greenbrier, kind of in between uh, Greenbrier and um, Damascus. Mm -hmm. And so he at first did not have a car. He would travel by donkey. And that was one of the things that his his son told me that they remembered about him. They remembered him riding off with his tool boxes on the side of the mule, making this noise, you know, as it went off down the road. Um, but his most of his buildings are located on main highways. They're not off in the woods. Um, so it was ease of access for him and ease of access to the quarries that he got his rocks from. But sometimes the rocks did come from the farmer's land if they had a creek or something, he could get it from the creek bed. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Okay. We've got some more Silas. Hang on. Okay. In addition to teaching his children the masonry skills, do you think there were others? Are there any that were inspired by him and tried to replicate his style? Yes, definitely. The kids that worked with him went on to do masonry work. Uh, his own son did masonry work after him, but they're the mayor of Solomon Grove was one of his team members, and he he lived lived in a mixed masonry house constructed by Silas Evans and his team. He's since passed away, but yes, he continued on with it besides being the mayor. 
Interesting. Okay, let's see. So I'm looking through your comments. You get lots of nice comments. People sharing the, the barns that they have on their property. Oh, okay, let me go cool. back here. <clears throat> oh, and uh, this is from a, a Drew County resident. Can you please spell the name of the marker maker in Drew County that you talked about? And do you know of his race? He was white. Um, he, his name was Hubert, H-U-B-E-R-T, Gumpert, G-U-M-P-E-R-T. And he, let's see, he died in 1989. Thank you. There's a fire truck coming, so I'm going to try to speak quickly. Hang on one second. In, in case you have to evacuate. <laughs> I hope not. It's not, it's not coming to me. It's just going through the intersection right here. Okay. Oh, people talking about how much they enjoy your cemetery workshops and appreciate them. And then a gentleman with the Washington County Cemetery Preservation Group, which is a 501c3, wanted to know if we could mention, and yes, I will mention, is the only in-stock source of D2, which is cleaning solution for historic grave markers in mid-America. Is that Bob Young? It is. <laughs> and he shared his phone number and email. So if anyone watching um, is interested in D2, well, not just historic grave markers, all grave markers for that matter. Mm -hmm. um, if you're interested in that and it's the safe way to do it, then we know how to, how to get you in touch with the supplier here in the state. Thank you. Any other questions or comments for Holly? Holly, um, do you have upcoming cemetery workshops this spring? We do. We have one um, for sure in Mariana at the Cedar Heights Cemetery, and that is April 15th. On May 13th, we are working with the group up there to do the Jasper Cemetery in Jasper. Um, I have not gotten formal permission yet, but I feel like it's imminent. <laughs> so, in fact, I need to call her when I get off here. And so all those workshops are free to attend. You just they're free. Sign up with you. you get a free lunch. Um, you can come just for one aspect of the workshop if you want to. If you want to learn about cleaning only, you can come in the morning and learn how to clean. And then if you want to learn about repair and leveling and straightening, you can come in the afternoon for that. Or if you just want to walk around and clean things while we're doing basic repair and straightening, that's cool too. It's just it's very informal. And you get okay. a free lunch. Did I say that? Free lunch? I don't know. That's very important. Free food. <laughs> okay. So I'm assuming you can find all this, more information on all of these on the website? Yeah, you will when we get it up. Okay. Okay. And I great. also have a mailing list. Um, so if anybody wants to be put on my mailing list, just let me know. Okay, I already shared your email address in the chat, so now everybody knows how to track you down. <laughs> okay, I see lots of other good jobs, and everyone enjoyed it. Thank you so much, Holly. Thank you, Rachel. You're welcome. Okay, bye, everybody. See you next month.